Hello, this is Peter Baxter, Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. It's a great privilege to introduce this month's podcast, where we will be discussing the paper The Central Role of Trunk Control in the Gross Motor Function of Children with Cerebral Palsy, a Retrospective Cross-Sectional Study, which is authored by Derek Curtis, Penny Butler, Sandra Savidra, Jesper Benke, Thomas Canemos, Stig Sonholm, and Marjorie Woolacott and is appearing in the April 2015 issue of the journal. It will be discussed by Derek Curtis, PhD student at Fridor Hospital, Copenhagen, Denmark, who's the first author, and Professor Kurt Deslouvert, Professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Science, KU Leuven, Belgium, who's written a commentary on the article. In the same April issue, there's another paper on the same topic by Cesar et al., but unfortunately those authors are not able to join us in this podcast. Can we please start with you, Derek, to outline the paper and its background? In summary, the, the paper is looking at the relationship between segmental control of the trunk and looking at the, the functioning in children with cerebral palsy. And the whole uh, topic takes inspiration in the SATCO test, which looks at the trunk as being, instead of a single segment of the body, as actually being a number of segments where control can be different in the segments. And the theory is that the trunk control starts at the head and works its way down the trunk, and we can actually go in and using a clinical test and see how discrete trunk control is, both static, active, and reactive at the different levels in the trunk. So this study was actually looking at this way of evaluating trunk control and looking and seeing, is there any kind of correlation, any kind of connection between the trunk control we measure using the SATCO test and the motor function of the children that we're testing. And it was simply a retrospective study, so we used data that was already collected, looking at gross motor function measure, looking at PD test, and looking at the SATCO that was recorded at the same time for the children, and did a linear regression on the data, and we found out that there was a factor, a, quite a good correlation, quite a good connection between what we measured as SATCO, the discrete level of control at different parts of the trunk, and the children's or the youth's gross motor function um, and PD score. And in fact, we could explain around 30 to 40 percent of the gross motor function level from looking at the, the trunk control measured using the SATCO test. I um, have read this uh, paper with a lot of interest because trunk control is a very important issue in children with cerebral palsy, and only a small number of studies have been. Uh, focusing on this topic. There are quite some studies on the development of postural control and trunk control in typical developing children and also a bit in cerebral palsy. But really the trunk control in CPs on itself is quite limited and, and the study by Derek Curtis is very interesting in this field. Um, it actually is an, an important study in one important domain on trunk control, which is the trunk control assessed by clinical scales. And um, as was mentioned by Derek, it is um, by means of the SATCO scale, which is a scale that has been proven to be reliable and, and also sensitive to discriminate between different groups. So this was also confirmed by the study of Curtis, which allows us now to, to make more general conclusions. It becomes quite obvious that there is a clear correlation between the cross motor function and the trunk control. Apart from these clinical scales, then we have the second field, which is the influence of, of trunk behavior on global function, um, which could also be evaluated by GAIT. And actually, the study of, of Curtis is looking at the real gross motor function, which is evaluated by uh, GMFM. But um, evaluating trunk during GAIT is a very nice addition to that, I think. And a comment I have on, on the study is that this is mainly focusing on more involved children or the use of the SATCO in, in general has actually most been used in more involved children or in younger children. So it's not ready to be generalized to the whole cerebral palsy population and the use of SATCO is probably not so good in the less involved children and there probably the TCMS, the Trunk Control Measurement Scale, might be complementary to this field. So I think these are very interesting contributions to the whole mystery there still is about the role of, of trunk in, in global function. What now needs to be done still, and an urgent aspect is, is that we should bring it to the treatment, because so far with the use of SATCO or the TCMS or the use of clinical motion analysis, 
not that much has been done yet on the level of the effect of treatment or using these skills to fine-tune the treatment and set up a full rehabilitation program. I agree very much with Katis Lua. It has been used a lot on children who are, are very involved. I think there is some value to be had nevertheless. I work similarly in, in a gait analysis laboratory, and we see a lot of children who actually have a reasonably good gait function, but we see a lot of compensations. We've seen in a, in a number of studies where, in fact, maybe there is some compensations in the lower extremities for trunk control, which is missing. And I think one of the very interesting things with the SACCO test and using this is that it allows us to identify where the intervention should be if we're going to try to improve trunk control. And I think this is where it, it's a little bit different to the other trunk control measures, that, that they're very good at measuring a lack of trunk control, or but maybe not so specific in going in and saying, well, where should we as, as therapists or as going in and treating these children, where should we actually focus our attention in terms of improving the trunk control? I think that's one of the interesting things with it, and I certainly see a lot of children in the gate lab who, for example, walk with a hyperlordosis, and you wonder sometimes, is this a way of stabilizing the, the lumbar spine with a lack of trunk control in that part of the spine? Should we be going in and looking at doing some more trunk control training with them rather than looking at the problem in the lower extremities? Uh, this is where I think the SATCO is quite interesting, and uh, we have some ideas about, <laughs> as you say, doing some sort of gait studies where we look at SATCO and look at gait deviation and see, can we see some sort of connection in this group as well, because I think probably the SATCO would also have some useful information for children in GMSCS 1 and 2, although, of course, it's, it's the real power, I think, certainly in, in this piece of work and in some studies I've been doing with my PhD is in the children who are more affected. So, uh, yes, I, I think we, we fully agree on this aspect that uh, the relation to gait, global function, is very interesting, and the strength of the SATCO by being able to decompose the different levels of involvement is, is a very interesting aspect that is a bit missing in other um, skills. On the other hand, what our experience, and I'm referring to the, the PhD student who was involved in this, who is now a postdoc fellow, Lieve Herman. She also did some tests with the SATCO and also highlighted that in the more the less involved children, she easily gets to a maximum score. So mm -hmm. then it's a bit quite difficult to still use it to set up treatment. But I, probably in the GMSCS level three children or the more involved GMSCS levels two, this might still be very interesting to combine both scales to define the, the level of involvement uh, by using the SATCO and then also adding information from the uh, trend control measurement scale for which we, we get more information on, on the selective movement control and dynamic reaching. So it's, it's a more dynamic scale compared to the, the SATCO. So for the mid-group, the, the more involved mid-group of children with cerebral palsy, I think these two tests are more complementary. For the more involved children, probably the SATCO is the best one because rehabilitation would mainly also focusing on getting more stability in the trunk. While for the less involved children, the DCMS might be more useful because then we are focusing our rehabilitation more on dynamic sitting balance and also improving the quality of the movement and the performance. So it looks like they are very complementary, not only from a content point of view, but also from the target group point of view, mm. and they have a certain mid-group in common, probably. And I'm, I'm very much in agreement with you, and, and I think it would be interesting to, to look at the information we get from these two tests on that group of children, which, in fact, could actually have the trunk control measurement scale and the SATCO and see if there's anything new we can get out of using them both. But I, I think probably you're absolutely right that they're extremely complementary, and I think with the SATCO test, we have a ceiling effect for some children. By the time you've got all the way down, then there's not a lot more testing. There are no movements which pull you out close to your edge of the base of support or anything. So, so I think probably the trunk control measurement scale, as you say, is much better in terms of forward planning of movement and balance control than the SATCO test. So, but it, it would be very interesting to, to test with both tests on a group of children and see how complementary they actually were. Also, from our own work and also the things I've been reading from your group and also other groups, what I'm a bit missing in all the skills and the 3D motion analysis is the, um, the quantification of the amount of asymmetry, not only for the unilateral involved children, but also for the bilateral involved children who are asymmetric. That's something we might give a bit more attention to that. I don't know how this is taken into account in the SATCO scale. 
in terms of scoring, there there is no scoring in terms of a symmetry that you score the left or the right side differently, and you can distinguish between them. So uh, either have the have the skill, you have the stability at that level, or you don't have it. So it's a binary system. So in terms of actually distinguishing a symmetry, it doesn't actually do that. Yes, I think there we, we can mm. learn some more. The only group I know that has worked on that is the group from Torch Trondheim in Norway, and they, mm. they used accelerometry and quantified asymmetry based on one value. But probably if you would like to relate it to rehabilitation issues, it would be interesting to really do it on a subscale level as well and see where we, we can focus on rehabilitation because asymmetry is really something we, we like to avoid in, in all children. Yes. So it looks like it's a challenge for the future. The other things for the future, do you think? Well, in the field of, of movement analysis, and then I'm mainly focusing on gait, I think to get more insight in the relation between the clinical scales, like the SATCO and the TCMS, is uh, probably by also uh, changing the gait a bit in a more high demanding level. Instead of just walking, maybe use inclined walking or stair, descent, and ascent. Because we have a bit of a problem with the trunk that trunk motion is, is rather submaximal during gait. And we only ask a small amount of strength at the level of the trunk to walk. But when we force the patients to do unipedal standing and or maybe a bet, an increased push-off while having inclined walking, we might find stronger correlations between the trunk scales and the trunk motions during gait, which might help us to really localize the problems and define rehabilitation guidelines based on that. I agree. I, th I think it's it's very interesting um, to, to see how important, uh, how, how good trunk stability do you need to walk and how does trunk stability affect the way you walk. And I think there are some, certainly from where I'm working here and I work in the gate lab as well, we, we analyze a, a number of children every week so that our analysis is very much focused from the pelvis and downwards in, in traditional gait analysis. I, I think probably we could learn some more by looking above the pelvis a little bit more carefully and making sure that some of the things we see uh, in the lower extremities are not compensations for poor trunk stability. And I think that might be, in, in some cases, as, as we've discussed, certainly in GMSCS3 and certainly a number of twos as well, I would expect we would find some kind of trunk abnormality or, or lack of trunk control, which may cause some gait deviations. And it, it may be interesting to take those into account when we're looking at rehabilitation program for those children. We now have access to the treadmills, and the treadmills allows us to evaluate what's happening with inclined walking without mm. making very strange constructions, and also stair walking. Um, but I think Derek mentioned a very nice point. We don't really know the compensatory role of the trunk to the lower limb or the lower limb to the trunk. It's the question of what's the chicken and what's the egg, and some approaches have highlighted that a lot of trunk pathology might be caused by lower limb problems or upper limb problems. If you want to reach something you can't get there, you might compensate by the trunk. While other studies have highlighted that the trunk motion is causing lower limb problems. So like Derek just mentioned, I think it's very interesting at that point to, to try to plan interventions. If we plan interventions on the lower limb, for instance, and they are very successful, and then we get what the effect is on the trunk pathology and also the other way around, when we treat the trunk, try to make it more stronger or give specific exercises to improve the control, we might evaluate what the influence is on the lower limb or on the upper limb motions. So I think there is lots of things to do, and interventions and rehabilitations is, again, a very important aspect in this field, probably. I've been working with Penny Butler for, for quite a few years, and it's her who's, who is really the whole start to this sort of segmental analysis of trunk control and, and I think it's a very interesting theory and a very interesting way of looking at movement and uh, I think in, in walking very interesting but I think also in the children who are more severely affected that the actual technique of looking at trunk control and looking at the level of trunk control could be very interesting when we're looking at for example trunk supports in wheelchairs, in working chairs, in walking aids, also looking at garments, lycra garments to help children with their trunk control because it seems to me that quite often we give a lot of trunk control to a child by giving them trunk supports and it's not easy to see if we've given too much support. And I think maybe this way of looking at trunk support may give us some better choices 
in terms of how high do we support the children, where is it we're supporting them so that we're actually encouraging them to improve their trunk control and not bracing them so much that they're actually being inhibited from developing trunk control. So I think my thoughts are very much to, to the more severely affected children where it seems to be that if we can support them a little bit more, we can get a better function, but without supporting them too much, of course, because then we remove function from them. I fully agree with that. Um, the work of Professor Butler is very interesting, mm. especially in this field and in these more severely involved children, and also maybe in the children with cerebral palsy who are not purely affected by spasticity, but also dyskinesia. Mm. Mm. I think their providing stabilities, as just mentioned, mm. gives a lot of uh, opens a, a lot of new possibilities for these children to control the other motions, the motions of the upper limb, of the, of the lower limbs. I fully agree with that, and I think that is really a concrete field to help with rehabilitation in these more involved children. Well, we've now come to the end of our podcast. Thank you very much indeed, both to Derek Curtis and to Professor Eckhart Deslouvert for a very, very illuminating discussion. Just to remind our listeners that the article is The Central Role of Trunk Control in the Gross Motor Function of Children with Cerebral Palsy, a Retrospective Cross-Sectional Study by Curtis et al. in the April 2015 issue.